Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Lead Academy Strength and Conditioning Coach at the Sheffield United Academy, Luke Jenkinson. This episode of the Pacey Performance Podcast is sponsored by simplyfaster.com and that's spelled S-I-M-P-L-I faster.com. So alongside the free lap timing systems, simplyfaster.com currently holds the eccentric K-Box. So if you haven't heard of the K-Box, it's a new product that uses flywheel technology to allow higher velocity eccentric overload. So I saw the K-Box the first time when Mike Young from the US brought a couple over for one of his workshops in Gloucester. So off the back of that I was really keen to use one and I actually got my hands on one and was able to spend a couple of hours playing around with lots of different exercises and getting used to the K-Box. So from personal experience, getting out of the bottom of the squat, powering up and having the K-Box pull you through the floor on the way down is absolutely incredible. So basically, the harder you go on the concentric portion of the lift, the more it's going to give you on the eccentric. So if you're going to go for it, you're going to get pulled through the floor. At simplyfaster.com, there's also a great blog from Frederick, who is one of the co-owners of Eccentric. So you can learn more about the K-Box there. So if you are interested in getting a K-Box, get to simplyfaster.com. So that's S-I-M-P-L-I, faster.com, and get a K-Box for yourself. So I'm really pleased that episode 60 has coincided with me getting on a good friend of mine in in Luke Jenkinson. So I really wanted to get Luke on because we we speak regularly uh, and I think he's really got something to offer uh, in terms of his his work with the Sheffield United Academy. So Sheffield United has become a bit of a kind of a hub for for young players, um, guys that have gone on to the Premier League, play for England over the last couple of years. Really successful uh, football academy over here in the UK. So the crux of the conversation with Luke is based around his, his multi-sports program with the, with the younger age groups in the academy, so 16 years old and down. So he incorporates a lot of play. And in the, in the, in the podcast, he kind of justifies that um, and, and goes on to talk about how he's looking to develop people just as well as develop footballers. So that's really interesting from uh, from my point of view and I'm sure you'll uh, you'll think the same. So like I said, uh, Luke discusses his multi-sports program, uh, the role of play. He discusses his work alongside the FA uh, and how they've been very impressed with, uh, with the stuff Luke's been doing with the academy down at Sheffield United. So just before we get on to the episode with Luke, I just want to remind you that next Sunday, which is the 29th of November, I'm hosting the second episode of the Pacey Performance webinar series with Ian McKeough, who is the Head of Athletic Development at Port Adelaide in the AFL. So it's going to be a really interesting talk from Ian. He's a top guy and I'm sure he'll deliver because I'm really looking forward to it myself. So if you are interested in, in getting over to the webinar uh, on Sunday the 29th of November, just go to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Ian. So all the episodes are going to be recorded and all attendees are going to have seven days to watch the recording as many times as they want and then it's going to disappear after them seven days. So make sure if you're interested, go and check that out. If you want to catch up with all previous episodes of the podcast, just shoot over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast. Been a few requests for more youth focused podcasts. So I hope this kind of fits the bill. I'm sure it will. Let us know what you think. Let Luke know what you think. Let me know what you think. Uh, We'd be really interested to hear your feedback. So enjoy episode 50 of the podcast and I will speak to you soon. Hi guys. Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast. So today got, well, had the privilege of um, having a really good friend of mine in Luke Jenkinson, who is the Lead Academy SNC coach for Sheffield United Football Club Academy. So just thank Luke for giving his time to chat to me uh, over anyone on a Sunday evening. 
and just ask him to give us a little bit of a background on who he is, his experience, and what he's currently doing. So welcome to the podcast, Luke. Evening, Rob. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, it is great to have friends like you, um, as I say. But now, um, as you before mentioned, I'm the strength and conditioning coach at Sheffield United. I'm primarily accountable for sort of the athletic development side of our part-time players. So primarily the majority of my time spent with our schoolboy program, so under 16s and below. Although with a colleague of mine, Mark Pease, we, we do work all the way through to everything below the first team uh, with the under 18s and so on. Um, I've been at the club five years now, just over five years. I started off at the club as an intern. I was fortunate enough for that that intern, that part-time internship became a full-time internship. And then I began assisting Mark. And then with the introduction of EPPP, um, I, I was offered a full-time role with the club. Um, so not only do the academy like to think that they, they develop players from within, and we've been fairly successful at that over the years, uh, but also look to develop um, staff from within also. Um, and, and teach them them the way and the philosophy of the club and, and the ideologies that we have um, about developing players and people, really. So did we, did we uh, mention before when we were chatting that you were eighth top academy in the country or something? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't know how we currently stand. Uh, I believe that was an FA model based on... Um, how many players are playing currently playing in your first team? How many players are playing in the Premier League, for example? Um, the, the last count, I believe, we were at thirty-eight graduates have played for the first team. Um, so it's been it's been great, especially over the, the five years that I've been at the club, to see many players promoted through to our first team. We've had the youngest ever player to play for the first team came through a couple of seasons ago. Um, so it, it's nice to think, perhaps even if I contributed 0.01 percent to his development and his career it's great to see those guys and we had a game a couple of seasons ago where we finished with seven academy graduates on the pitch um at one point and two more on the bench so it, it, it's been it's a great club we have opportunity for players um to go through and progress so that there's value to our job almost it's not it's not a, a process that's just there for the sake of funding and so on we we're lucky that not only my boss in nick cox the academy manager but our first team manager and the club philosophy is is the development and, and recruitment of players for the first team through the academy process um, is at the center of that business model so uh, that 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 opportunity we feel is key for them um, and and it's great to be part of a, a part of a club that has that that opportunity and to feel that that our job is is ha, has value ultimately mm -hmm. so name a couple of lads that have come through and done well Oh, um, like I say, with George Long currently, um, athletically very, super, very good athlete, um, a goalkeeper of ours, um, and we've had Lewis Reed is is regularly in the first team at the moment. But as I say, the, there's been many more. The team that got through to the FA Youth Cup final, where unfortunately lost to Manchester United, has many graduates from that and that are now not only played for the first team. But um, of also making careers in and around in and around the country, so it's great to see these guys that have gone on on to bigger and better things, shall we say? But of course, some of the big names from your from the academy graduates, sort of pre uh, me being at the club. But you've got your likes of Kyle Walker and Kyle Norton that that went to Tottenham Hotspurs, Phil Jagielkas, and so on, captain in England. So there's um, there's been some some big names and some so there's lots of prospects coming. through through there um, but as I say we feel that that opportunity is key um, and it's all well and good trying to develop players and people um, but if they don't have an opportunity to go out and showcase um, their talent and their skills and what they have learnt then, then then what's what's the point and what's the process mm, absolutely so how was the how has the academy changed from when you first came into the job or as an intern uh, to what it looks like now um, as always, and I'd like to think that, that our programmes are constantly evolving and constantly developing and perhaps what I look at, I was doing a few years ago, and it's very different to what I'm doing now and perhaps if I look to the future to 2020, it'll be very different to what we're currently doing now. But um, 
the philosophy of the club changed heavily with Nick Cox, um, as I say, our academy director coming into the club, who has brought in um, very much a games-based approach um, just through his work with the FA and through Mick Matthews, our, our FA advisor, um, just looking into previous research. And his Nick was previously at Watford, um, so another very successful academy. Um, he's able to take and draw upon many experiences and what the players look like five years from performance, what the players look like eight years from performance. Um, and not only that talent identification, but, but that real intrinsic development of skill and talent and, and the drive for players and where they're going to get to. So as I say, we've taken a games-based approach, uh, very open loop, very chaotic, very random, lots of external stimuli, um, opposed to directly with the athletic programme that I inherited uh, was perhaps the opposite at the other end of the spectrum, uh, very closed loop, uh, very micromanagement of players, not very engaging, I would say. Um, but we, we, we do appreciate that there's a, there's a coaching ladder, there's a coaching pyramid, and there is there's times when you need to be at the bottom of that ladder. There is there is times that are appropriate for the, those closed loop micromanagement um, of, of skill acquisition primarily. But we're set the task from a footballing coach, from a technical tactical point of view, is to coach as high up that that coaching ladder as possible, so as close to the real world and close to the game. Um, as I say, the the program I inherited and was originally part of, I, I could see perhaps players were getting tech technically better um, and I, as I say I, I do work um, at the University of Derby um, assisting the, the clinician module. I look at the, a lot of the education pathways here in, in UK and looking at athlete development and I see it to be very close loop, uh, very let's take a balance in the exercise for example, can you stand on one leg and move your arms around it and these these very basic drills and does that actually one stimulate the player, does it engage the player, does it does it develop what we're looking to develop um, and what I noticed is I was, I was developing players that were perhaps very good in closed loop environments, um, that they were very good in practice but but we were perhaps not getting as much trans transition to the performance field as, out as we would like. So began spending more and more time watching games, watching players, looking at them in many different environments and assessing movement competency, control, um, the, the basic rhythmical patterning of, of these young players and, and trying to assess where they were at and how we could transfer practice to performance and, and all the different ways that we could get these, these children to ultimately learn their body um, and develop their ability to perform skills. Uh, what, what, how these, what these skills may be may vary, whether this is in a, a footballing environment, whether it's in a sporting environment, or whether it's just in a basic locomotive pattern. Um, but that, that was where my initial questioning came from, um, that we needed to bridge the gap from practice to performance because something was falling short somewhere. Um, when Nick introduced his program um, or intr introduced his his ideas and his philosoph philosophies of coaching, um, which I know we're going to touch on later on, but we we felt that even though we're a, a successful academy that has opportunity that is that has that is developing players successfully, the numbers are still stacked against these kids. These numbers are still stacked against the kids for them to get to where they want to get to, uh, which is a full-time career ultimately. Um, so we have a massive emphasis on developing players as well as people, uh, or people as well as players, uh, because ultimately the vast majority of them are going to be unsuccessful. And we've been set the challenge of if we bump into a child in 10 years time in a local shopping mall or in or in a supermarket for example is we need to see we want these kids to even if they have been released for them to look back at these years and these many hours that they're spending at, at, at football clubs now with the introduction of e triple p and training hours and early recruitment um we need them to look back at this time and think yeah maybe i wasn't successful but i had an amazing time i learned x y and z i became a better person and look back on it on, on, as a really memorable and a positive experience and not one of failure just because the, the end goal wasn't met. So we're just enjoying the journey as well as the, hopefully the destination for them and making that destination as likely as possible, I would say. Cool. So um, 
I've I've heard you speak on the on the subject before, but do you just want to talk to us a little bit about your kind of multi sports program from especially in the in the younger age groups? And because I've seen on on you've we spoke about it personally, but you've put on Twitter about going to the English Institute of Sport and doing different you know sports days and things like that. Do you just want to talk to us about how you integrate that into your program and why? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's a massive thing that we, we've we've introduced. In particular, last year was our uh, last season was our first season that we introduced it. So we we trialed it for um, around three months, um, a couple of years back, and then we introduced it at the start of last season. So we've only one season into this program, but as you say. Um, we, we've we've taken the approach of that we all know the the inherent difficulties and issues that can come with early specialization um and so we've taken approach a multi multi-sport approach uh late specialization uh we're very fortunate of our location we're a mile away from the sheffield institute of sport we have some ex-teachers that were uh, that work with us full-time as coaches now um, that, that have access to, to facilities around the city um, and we, we've recently just been doing some work with the uh, lead uh, Great British Boulder coach um, so we're trying to cr create as many contacts in and around the city where we're able to offer a real diverse move what we what we've turned a movement skills program um, so by what what we mean by that program is the the foundation phase, so our under eights through to under elevens, but this transfers all the way up to our under fourteens and and further prepubescent children, sort of pre peak height velocity. Uh, will engage them in a, in a multi sports program, um, so they will have three movement skill sessions a week, uh, each lasting twenty five minutes, half an hour. So they're getting around uh, an hour and a half contact time with us a week. Um, of course, we detract a lot from what they're what they're able to do in terms of other sports as children, purely because of the amount of volume that they're having to train in football. Um, so Nick challenged us to create. If we can't expose them to other sports away from the building, then we need to expose them to these other sports and these other experiences inside the building. Um, so as part of our program, we have a, a, a heavy emphasis on sort of rhythmical uh, dance and gymnastics um, and, and the children learning to use their bodies holistically. Um, we have a, a heavy en emphasis on team invasion sports and the, and the ability to manipulate these team invasion games to get desired outcomes. Um, as you say, we will do, we've have taken kids to we've linked up with Sheffield Parkour. Um, we've taken some of the kids down to parkour um, on a few occasions and, and challenged them physically in, in environments that they're not used to. Uh, and it's it's I don't have any facts, I don't have any numbers for this, but it's there's there's clearly direct correlation to the technically the best players, the best movers on the field um in all these different environments that i take them to as you say if it's the is if we're if it's basically an athletics day if we're playing basketball if we're playing futsal if we're ice skating if we're doing parkour if we're doing trampolining if we're doing gymnastics um then these best these better movers that will that will turn them as these more rhythmical these more balanced these more coordinated the the posturally strong players this transfers into all these other chaotic random environments that, that require this full bodied movement so as we've noticed this correlation we then decided that if we're wanting the these players that that we've deemed that need to progress physically and to progress with their their general physical literacy and their competency to create shapes and movements with their body then why not try and develop them in all these other environments that we feel that really engages them, um, that are enjoyable, that are different, um, and get the transfer from practice to performance there. Um, so that that's the basic philosophy behind the program that that we that they can't expose themselves to these environments outside of the club. So can we try and bring them inside of the club? But that hasn't meant that we've just become a glorified PE teacher. They get these exposures elsewhere. So as I say, it's using sort of the the FA youth modules um, that would that I've that we've been through and taking basic 
team invasion games and using the step principles for example of how can we how we can change this this these these dynamics of a game and the setup of the games and the and the aims and the, the distances that they're working on to get desired outcomes whether that's whether it's coordination balance acceleration change of direction um and and, and try and teach them in that environment so my ma my main premise is that i want to be able to that there has to be an heavy a heavy emphasis on play and the importance of play and games um and that there's there's a lot that children can learn both socially technically tactically physically in these games and and look back to how we learn um perhaps not maybe you me and you rob but maybe how our parents learned that, uh, what did play used to look like and and we've taken inspiration from people like kelvin giles and looked at 1950s pe curriculum and looked at all all sort of pre-world war ii military programs and, and through assault courses and and, and full-bodied movement and the control of movement and tried to take draw inspiration from those gymnasts judo grappling wrestling sports uh, and taken those in into a sporting context to use these as the the modality um, to get the desired outcomes and for me um as I, as i was mentioning to you before at the moment i don't have any quantifiable data to say yes this program's working better than previous um the only thing that i can say is it's certainly not any worse than the program that we were delivering before but for me the the biggest and the most important part of, of this program that would that we currently have that is still developing it's still not a final product is that we have engagement and we have buy-in um and we, Nick speaks about a TED talk that he watched um, about looking into your athlete's eyes and seeing why they're not shining back at you. And the only reason that they're not shining back at you is, is as, a, as a result of you uh, as the coach. Therefore, we now have a situation where I'm seeing players enjoying coming to sessions, looking forward to coming to sessions, that it's not a chore or that they're just being thrown into a physical session. It's not just a rest period. It's not just something to break up football, that it's actually a training modality that holds importance and development, but important, the most importantly, engagement and buying. Um, and as you know, whether you're in a weight room, whether you're out on the field, just ticking over, 50% here and there, you're going to get little if no returns from that in development. Whereas whilst ever I have engagement and I have buy-in from our players uh, and I'm coaching them in their environment, then I know think movement's maximal. I can dip in and coach them in their own environment. Um, that If we're looking at acceleration, well, what's the point in setting up a drill where I'm going to tell you we've got 10 kids in, in three lines and I'm saying go, 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 because one, I'm not getting a maximal acceleration realistically. Um, I've not got much buying. I've not got much engagement. Yes, I'm racing against the kid next to me, but we're probably going to stop three metres from the 10 metre line. Uh, we're going to start decelerating. Whereas if I'm, I'm going to put you in an environment where there's a clear goal or a gate you've got to get through and you're getting chased and that, that there's cause and effect and there's consequences if you don't get there, then, then I can guarantee these more maximal accelerations, movements, um, in more chaotic and random environments. And we hold a lot of value on the ability to recognize other people's movements and move in the starting blocks. So team invasion sports aren't a hundred meter race. Our ability to move our starting blocks are possible. So not only do we want to develop these athletic qualities, of speed, power, endurance, and so on as real broad terms, but we are actually able to move our starting blocks to get to get them um, uh, to read perceptions of movements uh, and trickery through movement um, uh, and deal with them in that environment. So that's sort of where we're at, and we're looking to what I speak to our interns about at the club is that I've seen and uh, from experiences of other clubs and stuff that I've seen on on the internet is is play, athletes coming into sessions with set goals and drills that they're going to perform to the coach's session um whereas we hold a much greater emphasis on i'm going to set up an environment um whether this be a playground environment um i'm going to set you certain challenges and tasks and boundaries and then it's for you as the foundation phase kids so sort of 11 and below to go out there and figure this out for yourself um for you to to go out and can you challenge yourself in this way 
can you do a forward roll into a single leg get up for example um, because we've got the concentric phase of a with a little bit more men, momentum there but we've got a single leg squat there for example in, a, in an eight nine year old um, can we refine movement through cartwheels and round offs and set you challenges when we have very little equipment that we used everything that we're doing at the moment is, is not of a great cost it can be done anywhere and everywhere it's just being in, in, in a relatively safe environment and an accept and an accepting environment from you, your fellow coaches that the kids do get hurt when they play and that the the, the exercises aren't inherently dangerous but we'll touch on it later we went to the fa foundation national conference and from a few of the technical tactical coaches they were like we can't do that because they might get hurt and i just see is, is this any more dangerous than the sport of football itself no is it any more dangerous than than what they would do in a playground if kids were able to play and learn and discover themselves no it's not so why are we restricting these kids why are we rescuing them too quickly when when there is opportunity for them to learn how to use their body and it may take falling once it may take a, a butt slap in a forward roll um, to teach you not to do it again but but it soon gives you feedback to how you can improve your own performance and by what we found by coaching the kids in their own environment is that rather than me telling them how to get from a to b uh, and giving them the answer is that there's that there's perhaps many different ways of getting there that not only did i not realize but the kids have figured out for themselves but that that runs deeper with them and they retain information just through basic learning models and motor motor skill uh, models that they will retain this information and that there's deeper neural pathways that are laid from them discovering this movement themselves opposed to me going we're going to take one hand off the floor and then the other hand and we're going to turn this way whereas if i challenge you to get your sheffield united badge from the floor to the ceiling but you can only take one hand and one foot off the floor for example is that there's many different ways of getting there but if we're looking to refine lumbar pelvic control or core coordination then we can teach them in their environment that there's guided discovery that there's lots and lots of repetition it's not just me stood on a line going yep yeah, go yep yeah, go we're going to get loads and loads of opportunities to perform the skills or the locomotive patterning that we want to do and we're going to coach them in that environment however how it becomes individualized from there is perhaps there's something that you're struggling on perhaps there's something that you can't get in this chaotic um, this environment that has loads and loads of external stimuli then we need to step down that coaching ladder and that's why i said at the start that it's not exclusively all play it's not all at the top of that coaching ladder there is times when you that those players need to be regressed just as there is in a weight room environment um so that's when we'll start developing remedial work or getting them to work on stuff in in a, in a more closed loop environment and giving them challenge cards or work to do at home away from us or taking how we program at the club is that they will do four weeks of a, of a six-week mesa cycle they'll be working on a, on a given topic um, so again whether that be coordination balance change direction uh, acceleration for example and then the final two weeks of the mesa cycle will be spent working on either your strengths or your weaknesses the ultimately the the things that are going to help hold you back from progressing as a youth athlete so these remedial weeks aren't just for those that are struggling in an area it may be the fact that you're really quick but we understand that that's one of your outstanding qualities this is what's going to in the future athletically you're going to stand out to coaches and managers you're going to it's going to be an outstanding quality of your of your play therefore we need to work on making that even better so if we don't feel that one of the other traits is going to hold them back then we're going to we're going to put them in environments where they get lots of repetition at being quick they're going to have loads and loads of coaching at being quick how can we refine that movement to make it even quicker uh, and how can we ensure that that's going to transfer to performance so that's how we individualize the, the 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 foundation program that they will do will have remedial weeks they'll work on both their strengths their weaknesses nick uses a, a term that we want to push strengths and hide weaknesses because it's those outstanding qualities that will, 
will get a player noticed, whether they're 10 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old, 18 years old, or whether they're walking into a first team. It's that outstanding quality that, that a manager and a team are want to, go to uh, want to draw upon, in, in our opinion. Therefore, it's really important that we push these strengths and hide any potential weaknesses and ensure that these weaknesses one, won't hold them back, but two, we, we can work on them steadily over the years to ensure that they're not, they're not ultimately a weakness, uh, but they're just a trait or a skill of their, uh, of their body uh, and athleticism that isn't deficient, shall we say. Cool. Well, thanks for the uh, getting in depth. That's great. Um, you mentioned there about your uh, practical session at the FA National Conference. Do you just want to talk to us yeah. a little bit about how that came about and what exactly it was and what feedback you got? Yeah, so as I say, um, we have a, a really good relationship with uh, Mick Matthews from the FA, who's our regional uh, coach from the FA. Um, he works heavily with, with our technical tactical coaches, as I say. I've done my sort of level two, I've done my uh, youth modules one, two and three, so I've been fortunate to build up a good relationship with Mick um, and he deals closely with Nick um, and of course Mick Matthews works with Pete Sturgis who's the head of the foundation phase at the F and he's also the England Futsal national team manager. And Mick had gone back to Pete um, and explained that the sort of the philosophy that we have here at the club through the the games the games approach and, and being chaotic and being random um, and being as close to the game as possible and and not performing as many drills and closed loop pass from A to B run from cone yellow cone to orange cone for example and uh, Pete came along one evening and witnessed one of our gymnastic sessions and uh, I'm going to be completely honest with you here at first I didn't realize it was Pete Sturgis when he came um, and he came along and watched one of our sessions that we were performing that as I say it had some gymnastics in there it had sort of primal movements uh, so some basic sort of multi-directional uh, bear crawls and um, some monkey walks for example uh, and he just stood and watched that uh, um, and he, in his words, he said he made, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, he said he, we'd made an old man happy uh, uh, because he he feels that sports science or S&C or athletic development within football clubs in particular, um, uh, I think I'll be right in saying here, has maybe lost lost the, the tradition, uh, but also a lot of the positives from the traditional athletic development moves. Um, so he came and watched one of our sessions, was, was really impressed. He also came along and watched uh, technical and tactical coaches, uh, performing ball mastery drills, for example, taking games-based approach, small-sided games. Um, and he was fortunate enough to uh, invite Nick um, to go and present our, our club philosophy uh, down at the FA Foundation National uh, Conference. And I was fortunate enough for him to ask me to go and showcase our program down there um, along with we or to our head of coaching and our head of the foundation phase went down also um, and we did sort of 25 minutes movement skills and then we spent around 45 minutes of them showcasing some of our ball mastery in our small sided games and, and how we go about coaching um, uh, our younger players um, and our masterclass sessions that again are there to push strengths and hide weaknesses so we went down um, there was I believe there was around 100 coaches down there from all over the country from all different academies so there was Premier League Cat 1 academies there all the way down to some of your League 2 Cat 3 Cat 4 academies and um, we did some real basic stuff down there stuff that you, you can find on my Twitter um, we started off just with some gymnastics challenges, some movement skill challenges, um, a lot of play. Um, the players were instructed that we were working on balance, forward roll, get-ups and cartwheel derivatives and they were instructed to go and play. Uh, myself and Anthony Henry, my uh, uh, the lead intern, the full-time intern that we have at the club, were just there to go and coach them and refine these movements and set, set the players new challenges once we found that they were getting high levels of success. So that was the first part of the session that we did. Uh, the second session, uh, the second part, we went into some stick wrestling and some stick, uh, some broom handle challenges. We have loads of games that we play with broom handles. 
Um, so this is where I'll, I'll go on to it. This stuff doesn't have to be expensive. I was, I've been, went to my local hardware store across the road from where I live. I was able to purchase uh, 30 broom handles for 50p a broom handle uh, and we'll do stick wrestling and we'll do other movements with them and we'll use them as as uh, as challenges for can you do a diving forward roll across the river of doom for example um just to draw from one of the many crazy kids names and that, that we've come up with it but can i add rob that i've not come up with that name that's what the kids have called it so that's <laughs> yeah, a beautiful content yeah. for it, the river of doom because if you fall in the river you're doomed obviously um, and we uh, so that was the second part of the session um, and then the third part of the session uh, I'm going to give away one of my biggest inspirations for a lot of the movement skills program that we do here and that's taken from my childhood of gladiators um, my wife um, knows Helen O'Reilly who was Panther in the original Panthers and I've had discussions with Panther um, about some of the stuff that they did on the original gladiators and we showcased a game of Powerball um, in in the final stage. So an invasion game where we just use, I've purchased different coloured buckets from, again, from a hardware store. If I remember correctly, I think there was 74p a bucket. Again, I have about 30 of them. And then we use some ball pool balls that I purchased from Tesco's that were five or six pounds for, I don't know how many balls are in there. I'm going to take a while, I guess, 150 different coloured balls. Um, and we'll just set different, using the step principles from the FA, we'll set different challenges. So on one pitch, we had an underload overload. So we had a 5v3 game. Uh, and then on the other pitch, we had a 4v4 game uh, just to showcase what that looks like and the difference between going 3v5 and 4v4. Uh, and then, of course, you can manipulate the different buckets. But the, the aim of the game is purely invasion. It's getting away from players. It's, in, it's inva invading areas and uh, setting challenges. So different points on different coloured buckets. And uh, it's a very high intensity game. We, we, we'll vary how long we'll work for but it's pretty much going to be sub 60 seconds with a quicker changing round as possible but we do perform longer games uh when necessary and different challenges as i say we might manipulate the amount of buckets that are in there we might manipulate the amount of players you might manipulate the area uh, so there's lots of variables that you you can take from these games but some really very simple games but games that as I say, from right from the beginning we've got loads of balance we've got loads of coordination through our, our gymnastics movement we've got loads of uh, positive feedback from 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 the players about how to be honest with you rob our celebrations have got far better but how, does this, <laughs> how does that how does that transfer to performance um it's this let's say we, they, they can control their body better they've got better uh, hip knee ankle stability that we believe through performing these movements they're becoming more forceful and but as i say as i said half the kids love doing it and uh, they get in uh, full-bodied movements that takes high levels of strength coordination balance control all these paradigms that we look to develop as athletic development coaches uh, but we'll get kids that'll go away and they'll come back they refer to me as beef at the club, beef, 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 look, look what I can do. I've learned this new skill and that's when we'll throw them a new challenge card with a new, a new challenge and a new task. And that's when it becomes valuable to them. It becomes, if, if we show worth in them progressing and developing as a coach, this is just basic coach philosophy, but it's, if we put value on what they're doing, then they, they're giving us labs back um, you then go into the balance uh, the stick wrestling so we've got high levels of sort of muscular recruitment balance proprioception uh, we've got loads, loads of quick uh, foot patterning and, uh, and adjusting to that external stimuli um, and then you go into your your power ball game and we've got all, all the benefits of change of direction agility acceleration deceleration and we will then coach during those sessions so we will as coaches will stand back from the session we'll we'll set up the game flow let them play and then we'll we will ensure that we'll reinforce positive movements by ensuring that the that the players understand what they've done well uh, and can they do it again and can they recreate that movement but we will also coach them deficiencies and improve performance um so whether that might be see when you 
did that drop step or you took that side step can you keep your chest higher can you stay stronger in your upper body what's going to happen if your head goes left for example can you drop your hips a little bit lower get a stronger more positive quicker knee drive for example so all these these coaching cues that you see in your very you, your closed loop sprinting drills that are that i'm not doubting are, are highly important for sprinters um that that, that we take this into team invasion sports that, that there's a lot more um, that transfer to performance. So again, reading of players' own body, um, the reading of, of opponents' body, and can we move these starting blocks to get an edge on these players to to bring about successful, rhythmical, coordinated, balanced movement? Because that's what we see the the best players or the, these category one players or these ten out of tens in technical, tactical, social, psychological, uh, and athletic. Uh, players that 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 we that we see from we look at the best players in the world the best athletes in the world no matter what sport they are and I would say that that these are very rhythmical balanced coordinated powerful explosive posturally strong um, these are all traits that no matter how these players uh, end up whether they end up a footballer whether they don't end up a footballer whether you end up in other sports um, or just general life is going to bring around so it's all i'm concerned with is that the, the, the players are offered environments that are engaging environments that offer them loads of opportunities to repeat what they're good at loads of opportunities to repeat what they're not good at and i'm going to coach them and teach them in their environment and that holds value to them um so i'm in the process at the moment of putting i've been given the go-ahead to build a, a, tra a transverse indoor climbing wall which i'm very fortunate to do um we've also got the go ahead we will be building uh, um an outdoor playground just basic scaffolding just for players to go and learn to climb fall jump um so sort of a, a very basic parkour environment is what we're hoping to build it in the foreseeable future so other environments that these kids can expose themselves into and if you get to training half an hour early or if you've got an hour after training not only can you go and play um some games with your mates if there's other players around but just opportunities for them to go and play and discover their body uh, whether that's as i say climbing running sprinting kicking falling tumbling uh, we just want to enable these kids to, to like have the time of their life and it's not a boys club we, we still have to be elite uh, but we we believe and, and i know it's the environment that i would want to learn if in, that if I was enjoying what I was doing and I wanted to be there all the time then it's going to give me the best possible opportunity uh, to progress and develop and if I don't get to my end goal it's I'm going to look at all these hours that I've spent in that environment as as being good times that were beneficial for me as a child um, because as I say even though we're, we're a successful academy no matter what academy you're at you, you, the odds are stacked against you unfortunately Mm, no, it sounds like a, it sounds like the environment that I'd love to be in as a kid. Love to be yeah. going through an academy. So yeah, it sounds great. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. But one thing that I um, that I robbed from James Daly at the um, on his podcast is just to touch on uh, the recommendations for for young coaches to get into S and C in football specifically. Obviously, you've come through your internship at, at Chef United. There's been many other um, students and, and coaches that have come through internships at, at Chef United. How would you, what would you recommend to, to interns wanting to get involved in, in football specifically or other sports? Yeah, for me, it's, I look back at what I believed my role would look like when, when I looked out, when I started in SNC, I believe eight, nine years ago now, and it's a lot different to where I am now. Um, so maybe this, if I inform the listeners sort of what we look for in, in terms or in terms of developing coaches is that a lot of what I do is I take the, the scientific knowledge and the background and the underlying physiology and sort of the stuff we read in journals and the stuff that a sports scientist makes us tick. Um, and I, I take that and I try and just take a completely coaching head uh, approach um, 
So the ability to coach kids, the ability to understand that children aren't many have their own requirements, that they have their own needs, that they're engaged in different ways. Um, and what we teach a first team player, we shouldn't replicate on a smaller scale to a, to, to a child because they have different needs. Now, don't get me wrong, post puberty and when, when we get down to the more performance and business end, then that's we certainly get closer and closer to that stage. But at that age, they're closer to the end product. Um, so for me, it's just vitally important that that someone is a good coach and the importance of being a good coach and there are drills and environments and understand how manipulating these variables is going to affect the outcomes of a game just as if we were working at a more performance end of small sided games for physiological output outputs and the different GPS results we're going to get from that the same principles and and the same work can be be used um down at the younger age groups so being creative being inventive sometimes i set up drills and i have to really get my kids head on and just sometimes i think i'm a little bit crazy <laughs> <laughs> you see what what comes of these um these activities and these games and it's often not what you expected it to be um it's but um, there was loads of repetition. There was loads of opportunity for them to to perform what we wanted them to, to perform, or to get the outcome that the desired outcome that we were looking for. So for me, number one is just the ability to coach. Um, number two is just, a, as I say, a strong, sound knowledge base um, of of building the brilliant basics and knowing what those brilliant basics are uh, from a scientific standpoint and the foundations of athlete development uh, but also a knowledge of, of the sport and the game um, I would say I, I'm not an ex-footballer my, my footballing skill is is very low at the best shall we say <laughs> but the more and more youth football I watch the more and more pro the professional football I watch um, the more and more that I learn and understand of, of how it transfers to the game and as I said through doing some of my FA awards um, has given me an incredible insight into what do the football coaches where ultimately support staff what what are they taught because it's very different to what we're taught through the university uh, and other CPD pathways here at the, uh, uh, in the UK it's very different to what what they're being taught uh, through their own governing body um, so I think it's vital to understand what what the technical tactical staff are looking for in their athleticism and what they deem as athleticism and what they deem to transfer to performance uh, and, and have that that two-way relationship because ultimately um, as we look back to what Paul Bauer spoke about at the South Yorkshire performance seminar is that we're all out there to to improve the same outcomes um, and the, the better that we, the, the sooner we understand that, I'm sure the more harmonious world we will have out there through support staff, sports science staff and technical tactical coaches. Uh, I'm just very fortunate that I'm in an environment that, that allows me to be creative, that well doesn't allow me to, forces me to be creative. I'm challenged through my head of sports science and medicine, challenged through the academy director to create these environments and develop players in this way. Um, so yeah, they, they would be my big three. So to summarise just the ability to coach and the, the ability to deal with, with youth athletes, a grounded sense of, of scientific knowledge and the brilliant basics. And then thirdly, the, the transfer to performance and what, what the end goal looks to. But as I say, that comes later down the journey, that comes with, with the older players that I work with uh, and then through to the 18s and so on. Whereas at, at that younger end in particular with a foundation, I'm just concerned with building that we term the brilliant basis uh, basics, those foundation movements, that physical literacy, that competency to deal with their body in a in a multi multi sport environment in, with with loads of different stimuli uh, and then loads of different um, environments. Ultimately, absolutely cool. Well, just before I let you go, um, where can people get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, social media, email, what's the crack? Yeah, so um, the the pretty much the main. Uh, streams uh, through my Twitter um, I don't know if any of your listeners follow me already I'm a massive advocate of I think there's there is uh, I see quite a 
closed environment um, that's becoming more and more environment, uh, more and more open. Um, and one that I believe if we all share ideas as S&C coaches and we speak, we can always learn from one another, whether it's something we agree with, whether we disagree with it, it, it reinforces our beliefs and our ideas uh, and that we should open up because ultimately, if, we, if I learn more as a coach, importantly that transfers to the players and that's the most important thing not only does it benefit me it benefits players so if i can share ideas so that's pretty much through my twitter page which is at luke gattus so that's l-u-k-e-g-a-t-u-s which is a previous surname of mine so um or you can get me at my email address at the club so which is luke.jenkinson at sufc.co.uk um but as i say i believe if we were a lot more open um, and we were a lot more transparent about what we were doing and why we were doing it and, and how it benefits and the pros and cons of it, then by all means, uh, we, we, I believe we would all be in a better place. But I think perhaps people are slightly reserved because they feel it's their own product or it's their own brand or, or they're not prepared to uh, put themselves up for scrutiny perhaps. But um, as I say, I'm, I'm not saying what we currently do is the the optimal or the the best way and we're going to do it for heather because it is an evolving program but what we are saying is at the moment we are getting quite a lot of recognition for it we're getting a lot of buying from our players this isn't the future if anything we're looking back to what we used to do and, and what we did in the past and how we have learned in the past and what play and games look like so uh, yeah my email address and uh, my twitter and my primary one so again that was at luke gatus g-a-t-u-s cool well, I'll let you get back to your um, your Sunday night. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, hope, I hope the wife comes back from a run. <laughs> yeah, I've just heard her come through the door, so she has returned Excellent. from a Sunday night run. Superb. Well, I'll uh, I'll let you go, and I'll uh, just just thank you for your time, and I'll uh, we'll no, catch thank up. You, Rob. We'll catch up soon, mate. We certainly will do. Thank you. All right, pal. Speak to you soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 60 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the chat with Luke. Just one thing before I let you go, if you are interested in signing up for the webinar with Ian McKeel, jump over to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash Ian and all the information and how to book on is there. So that's the 29th of December and that's at 10 a.m. GMT. So I hope you enjoyed the chat with Luke and any feedback would be really appreciated and I will speak to you soon.